Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Michel Barbeau. I'm the director for the School of Computer Science. And we are uh, very pleased to welcome you to this uh, first lecture on computer science and society. Uh, and the, uh, tonight, tonight's uh, speaker uh, will be introduced by Professor Olga Bezer. So over to you, Olga. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I'm very delighted to welcome and introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Jeremy Clark. Jeremy Clark is an associate professor at the Concordia Institute for Information Systems Engineering. At Concordia, uh, he holds the industrial, industrial research chair in blockchain technologies. Dr. Clark has obtained his PhD degree from the University of Waterloo. That's where I met Jeremy as we took a secu security course together. Dr. Clark's PhD dissertation was on designing and deploying secure voting systems, including Skintegrity, the first cryptographically verifiable system that was used in a public sector election. For this breakthrough research, Dr. Clark's PhD dissertation was awarded a gold medal. He wrote one of the earliest academic papers on blockchain and Bitcoin, has completed dozens of projects research projects in this area and contributed to the first textbooks, uh, textbook on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technologies. Beyond research, Dr. Clark has worked on several, with several municipalities on voting systems and testified to both the Canadian Senate and House Finance Committees uh, on, on Bitcoin. He has given 30 plus presentations on black blockchain to government agencies different companies, investment funds, and many other audiences. Before I pass the lecture over to Jeremy, I would like to remind you all to post your questions for Q&A period that we're gonna have uh, to the chat, so Dr. Clark can answer them later on. And our CS CCSS team, um, William and Tiffany, will be handling a Q&A session. Now over to you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. And uh, well, let me start by saying it's a great honor uh, to be able to give this talk. And, you know, I have a lot of admiration for the computer science department at Carleton. I know many of you, uh, I did my postdoc at Carleton. So obviously I met a lot of you at that time, but people like Olga and, and others I met when I was a grad student and your faculty were grad students. And even in one case, it was a student who was at Concordia where I am now, and he's now a faculty member with you as well. So it feels kind of like a homecoming uh, whenever I get to, to come back to Carleton. And so I'm extra pleased uh, to give this talk. So uh, I will skip over my bio and I'll just quickly acknowledge that uh, our research is uh, funded by a lot of uh, great organizations, both in government and in industry. Okay, so before we dive into any technical details at all, I thought, Maybe we should just talk about the elephant in the room. So this is Bitcoin's price uh, in US dollars uh, over the last couple of years. And when I, actually, when I first started working on Bitcoin, I was a postdoc at Carleton. It was in 2012. Uh, we published a paper on it. Uh, I think it's the third, by my count, the third peer reviewed academic paper ever on it. Now there's like thousands of a year. And anyways, I, I obviously I'm not going to focus a lot on the price, but I, I did want to make two observations that, that maybe are interesting to you. So the first one is obviously anyone that holds Bitcoin is not pleased uh, when the price goes down. But I want to quickly mention that it's not a great thing that the price goes up either. It would be a great thing if we were talking about a retirement fund. But remember that Bitcoin was originally proposed as a currency. And so when prices increase, it's not good for a currency. It, it makes people hoard it. They, they don't want to spend it. Why would you spend something that might be worth twice as much in a month from now or two months from now? Uh, lots of speculators come into the market. It causes more volatility. And you would never borrow uh, anything in Bitcoin. Imagine if you took out a mortgage in 2016 and you, you lent, or sorry, you borrow Bitcoin. You, know, you bought your house, maybe converted to Canadian dollars. Imagine how much Bitcoin you have to pay back now or imagine the Canadian dollar value of that, right? There's no house on the planet earth that's worth that amount of money. Uh, so you can never have a mature economy that emerges as long as you have currencies that are like this, that are super volatile. 
Now, why is it worth $56,000 today US? I have not heard a good answer to this question in 10 years. And I don't have an answer myself, certainly. And I only have one remark, which is you should be very skeptical of anyone that thinks that they know the answer to this question, right? No one can tell you it should be worth way less or it should be worth way more. I mean, just nobody knows uh, why this is. That's, that's what I'm convinced of anyways. But what I can tell you a lot about is the kind of ideas that went into Bitcoin, how it's designed, what its properties are. So this is a figure that's in an article that we published in the communications of the ACM. And we were really trying to showcase the idea that Bitcoin didn't drop fully emerged out of thin air. It's really, uh, it's, it's a combination of a bunch of key components. They're represented by the vertical lines in this chart and it's a time chart. So the 1980s are at the top and then it goes to present as you move down the chart. And so the components of Bitcoin were being talked about in the 1980s. Um, so this should be encouraging to you if you're faculty, if you're a student, it means that, you know, there might be a great idea that's just sort of lying around and it's in plain sight, it just needs the right kind of combination. But at the same time, on the flip side, I don't want to diminish the contribution that Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, made by creating the Bitcoin system. It wasn't just a simple composition or a layering of four or five different things and, and then the system worked. Okay, there, there was really a key uh, kind of intellectual leap uh, that had to be made. And that leap is what we call the blockchain. So I give a lot of talks to industry and industry doesn't care about how it works so much. And you, you probably would be more interested in it, but it, you know I would blow my time limit just trying to explain it all. So I'm going to give you the high level picture of blockchain. What is it, you know, there's a blockchain sitting on your desk, you're picking it up, you're looking at it. What does it actually do? What problem does it solve? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Like how, how does it work? Um, so the way I see it is, I see it as a kind of finesse of the digital revolution, which is you have a bunch of paper records and you're going to throw it in a database or a server. And you're going to have a bunch of people who are going to read and write uh, these records. Now. Databases like this have, there's one problem in particular that they have, and it's not a technical problem, interestingly enough. It's actually a political problem, which is who is it that owns this database? Who is it that puts it up, who hosts the database? And you have to recognize that when you have a database, you're in a position of power. You control who has access, who can read to it, who can write from it, you can remove people. Uh, you can read all the records in the database. You could even go and change past records if you wanted to. And so there's a lot of power comes that comes from owning a database. And there's a lot of industries that cut across, like different companies are involved. Maybe the government's involved, but different governments in different countries. You know, think about things like, I don't know, supply chain, finance, managing identities. These are, are the kinds of issues where uh, the problem isn't could you digitize this information? It's where's that data going to sit? Like who, who's going to be in charge of maintaining that data, right? To give you a concrete example, let's say that you buy a car and you want to know the total carbon emissions that were created uh, or were emitted uh, in the creation of the car. And I don't just mean the assembly of the car. I mean, every component, every nut and bolt. You want like that total number and all the transport of all those materials, right? That could be digitized in theory Right, but but who's going to hold that information, right? And so, um, so anyway, so 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 that's a challenge with databases. The other challenge with databases is the problem of reconciliation, which is in this architecture, you always have two copies of your data. There's the data that you think is right that you're holding in your hand, and then there's the data that's on the database. And a lot of times, you have to spend time trying to figure out whether the database actually reflects what you believe are the true records. So banks do this, for example, they transfer money amongst themselves. Uh, there's a database that's run by Payments Canada. And so think of like all the payments between RBC and CIBC that happen in a day. So there's thousands of branches across Canada. So all of those little payments, they basically get aggregated. And at the end of the day, Payments Canada says, this is the, the number. This amount of money will move from RBC to CIBC. They go to the Bank of Canada and settle that, that transaction. Okay, but how does RBC know that that number is right? How do they know it didn't miss transactions? So they spend a lot of time doing uh, reconciliation. 
So the idea of blockchain is, okay, let's take the records that are in this database and let's give it a copy of them to the participants who are reading and writing from the database. So everyone gets a copy. Then what we're going to do is we're actually just going to get rid of the database in the middle. We're going to disintermediate it. Okay, so it's gone. And now what we need is we need, think of it as a synchronization protocol that's going to ensure that if I update my local copy of the records, then everyone else will update theirs exactly in the exact same way. Basically my change will get reflected around the network and same with everyone else, okay? If we can maintain this synchronization uh, across the network, then we don't have this power problem of, because there's no database, right? We're, we're all members of this network that's basically running a distributed database amongst ourselves. Now, blockchains aren't just for passive data. It's just a nice way of explaining it. What they, they can do more, they can actually execute code. So you could execute some code that will change the state of your database. And then all the other participants will execute that code as well. And they'll all update the state uh, of their database uh, with the same result. So this is great if you wanna do a currency system. So that's what Bitcoin does. It, it basically just does currency and there's a little flexibility to do things beyond currency, but it's, it's not very flexible. The second biggest blockchain uh, is called Ethereum and it's a much more general blockchain where you're allowed to write up your own code that you want executed in this blockchain environment. You can deploy it and uh, the blockchain will run it for you. Uh, so these, this code is called a, a decentralized application. Uh, it's also called a smart contract. I don't really like that term because it makes it sound like some sort of legal thing. It's, it's much better to think of it as like an application, like a web app or an application on your phone or something like that, uh, but a lot smaller. Speaking of which, uh, blockchain isn't the first or the only thing in computer science that tries to solve this problem. Okay, there are distributed systems, there's distributed databases. But this is what sort of makes blockchain different. It's a different kind of, the emphasis is on a different property. So the emphasis in blockchain is not on data size. It's, it's not a system for big data. In fact, it's for very, very tiny data. In Bitcoin, you can store one megabyte every 10 minutes. So think of your favorite song, put it into an MP3 format, probably about six megabytes. That would take you an hour to store in Bitcoin. And that's if you monopolize the entire blockchain. Uh, also with databases, you're always trying to optimize uh, the, the structure of the data so that you can respond to queries uh, very fast. Uh, in blockchain, there's none of that. There's, there's only one query, which is give me everything. And then you download the entire blockchain. That's basically all you can do. So hopefully, okay, this probably sounds like a terrible database. Why, why on earth would anyone want to use such a terrible thing? And so the answer is the emphasis is on security and integrity. So what a blockchain does is it ensures that the code executes correctly, even if some of the nodes on the network are malicious and are lying about what the state of the world is or, or what the results of certain computations are. Uh, also, once something's completed, if data is entered or a computation is completed, you can't change it, it's immutable. Now, I would be remiss to not mention that, that blockchains use a lot of cryptography and I'm hiding that cryptography uh, so, so I won't go into the cryptographic details, but this is why it's called a cryptocurrency. The crypto comes uh, from cryptography. And if you know a bit about cryptography, I can just spend a slide maybe kind of walking you through how it's used at a very high level. Um, so basically any action is authorized through the use of a digital signature. Uh, so that might be, I'm entitled to spend money because I signed for it. The money is assigned to my public key uh, for a signature scheme and I sign the transaction. Or if you write a DAP, you can control who's allowed to do what in terms of your DAP uh, through, through digital signatures. Uh, entities, because there's no real world identities, it's just public keys, it has a level of anonymity, but there's a bunch of practical reasons why Bitcoin is not particularly anonymous or Ethereum. I won't go through those details, but there's lots of research papers on de-anonymizing people uh, on blockchain technologies that, that you could look into if you're interested in it. Hash functions I'll be even more vague about. They're used extensively through the protocol. They're used for a bunch of different things. And uh, generally they, they kind of lock the data in. Now, one thing that's not used from cryptography, which is kind of the flagship you know, function of cryptography is encryption itself. And so blockchains don't use encryption ever. 
And there is this misconception, you know, people are like, you should put your health records on blockchain because it's secure and confidential. It is not, it absolutely is not. Blockchains, uh, all the information is transparent. Every node sees every single transaction, at least by default. Now you can layer encryption on if you want confidentiality. There's projects like Hyperledger, which is by IBM and the Linux Foundation. And they're looking at those, those kinds of approach, but out of the box, you get no confidentiality. Here's an article that uh, actually just yesterday, it was in the New York Times. Uh, it's on why Bill Gates is worried about the carbon footprint of Bitcoin. And so you've probably heard, you know, Bitcoin consumes a lot of electricity. Where is it? I mean, I just showed you kind of the system at a high level. Is it just because it's a large internet system? Is that where the electricity is? And the answer is no. A large system like that could run, you know, at a fraction, like one one thousandth of a percent of the electricity that Bitcoin consumes. Bitcoin's electricity problem is buried in a sub protocol. So I want to peel back uh, a bit of the detail and, and show you where it is. So it goes back to this idea of synchronization or consistency. So basically everyone's going to agree on how the ledger should be updated or the blockchain or the database should be up, updated. And the way that you traditionally take a consensus is by voting. Okay. Now you have to assume that you have at least a majority there on as some, some systems require a greater uh, threshold. And so that's fine. We'll, we'll make that assumption. And in any voting system, it always comes down to there's one vote per something, right? Per person, for example. So you can do one vote per person. And that's fine if you have a list of people that are allowed to participate in your network. So these are one flavor of blockchain. We call them permissioned uh, blockchain or private blockchains. So like say the bank wanted to run interbank settlements uh, with themselves, you know, RBC and CIBC, TD, they would all get one node and that's fine. There would be a list. It'd be very fast. They could use something called Byzantine fault tolerant protocols. It would require very little energy. Okay. But what Bitcoin wanted to do is a little more ambitious. They said, hey, we want to run on the open internet. We want to run where anyone can join or leave the network at any time. Now, if you want to have a system that works on voting where anyone can leave and join, how do you assign votes to people? Like you might say, well, maybe I'll, I'll give one vote per IP address. Well, I could create 10,000 IP addresses. I could have a block of IP addresses and say, oh, I'm actually 10,000 people, right? And so that's, that's not really secure. Uh, computers don't have like a, a unique serial number that can't be changed, okay? So there's no way to uniquely identify computers. Uh, so if you want to run on the open network, you have to think about something else. And so this was the main insight uh, uh, behind Bitcoin is there was this idea that if I want to know how many computers you have, I'm going to challenge you to solve a puzzle. And I'm going to say, okay, I have this puzzle for you. And I want you to run, you say you have 10 computers, great. I want you to run all 10 of those computers 24 seven. I want you to only solve this puzzle. And I have some sense of how long this puzzle takes to solve. And uh, if it looks like you're you know, running 10 computers, then I'm going to give you 10 votes, OK? And so the idea was you get one vote per kind of unit of computational effort. Now, the puzzle that they're being, that's being solved is completely arbitrary. It's not useful. It's not in the protocol at all. It's just a made up puzzle that takes computers a long time to solve. And that's where all the electricity gets burned. Now, it's not even computers. It's like ASIC chips that are custom you know, made only to solve this, this this arbitrary puzzle uh, that underlies Bitcoin's protocol. Uh, when new Bitcoin comes into circulation, it's given to the people who are doing this consensus mechanism. They're called miners. Uh, so there's an analogy with, with mining uh, the currency. Now, I, I also want to emphasize that what I gave you is actually an analogy for how it works. It's, it's not really how the protocol works. It's, it's a much this, this idea is kind of blended into the protocol at a much deeper level. So it doesn't work exactly like this, but if it piques your interest, I encourage you to go read uh, about the Bitcoin protocol because it's very, very cool how it, how it works in, in detail. All right, so let me show you some of the, the things that I think about and other people as well. I, actually, I'll put the emphasis on, on things that other people are, are, are thinking about. The, the things that I think are the big uh, issues for blockchain. And the number one issue is, is definitely scalability. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, so we have this you know, very expensive proof of work protocol. So if you could get rid of that, and there's some proposals are called things like proof of stake, proof of authority, 
that are aimed at at, at least re reducing the reliance on proof of work or, or actually eliminating it. If you could get rid of that, that, that would be great. So that's one step forward. Another issue is how much work each node in your blockchain network does. So to illustrate this, let's forget about blockchain for a second. Just think of a normal cloud architecture. So the user down here, Alice, she has some method that she wants computed. She asks for a node and, and maybe the service gives her the closest node and she sends the method that she wants computed and the server will reply with the answer. Okay, so that's nice. By contrast, the way blockchain works is you tell one node about the method you want executed. That node forwards that method to every other node on the network. Every single node on the network executes every single method that somebody wants run. And they do this consensus mechanism to say, we all agree that Z is the outcome of this method. So you're not just paying for one node to run your method, you're paying for all nodes to run your method. And in fact, there's even this notion of time where all nodes in the future are also at some point gonna to have to run your method to make sure that it was done correct. Okay, so this is like very, very expensive. It's very, it's high, highly redundant. Now you can see why this gives you great security properties, right? Because everyone's agreeing. And this is why code executes basically perfectly on something like Ethereum, but you can you can get the sense that this is very expensive and it's hard to scale. So what can you do about it? So one thing you could do is you could sort of partition your network and just have different subsets run uh, different methods. And then you might have to do some synchronization across uh, the different partitions or shards as they're called. Here's another idea that uses cryptography. And so the idea is that you could pick one node to run uh, your method and they'll figure out what the output is. And then what they're going to do is they're going to compute a proof that the output of this method on this input parameter on X produces Z, okay? And what they'll do is instead of getting all the nodes to recompute the method to make sure they agree with Z, they'll give them the proof that Z is correct, okay? So this works if verifying a proof is cheaper than recomputing the method itself. Okay, if it's cheaper, then you're saving a lot of work for these nodes. And it turns out with very fancy cryptography, you can make arbitrary computations. Uh, you can make proofs for them that evaluate in, in much less time uh, than it takes to actually evaluate the method itself. Now, the dark side of it is generating that proof itself is very expensive. So that purple node is doing way more work than you were asking them to do before but then all the blue nodes are doing way less work uh, than, than you were asking them to do before. So you would have to like average the computation across all of them to figure out if it's a net savings or, or not. So um, there's one paper, for example, this is a crypto, a recent paper. Uh, these technologies are related to something called zero knowledge proofs. Uh, they're sometimes called snarks. Uh, this is a slight variant called Starks because there's no uh, trusted setup. And uh, these people have a company, so this isn't our research, it's someone else's, and they have a company called Starkware and Starkware is kind of leading uh, the charge on, on doing these, uh, this technology, which is called a ZK rollup. Now here's a different approach, just to show you that there's, there's lots of different ideas and, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. You might, you might do uh, several of them, uh, but this is called an optimistic rollup. So here what happens is you just give your method to one node, the node executes it, and they say, I have $1,000 and my $1,000 says that Z is the output of this method. And they just post it and they leave it there for a while. And if no one disputes it, then Z is taken as correct. But if someone says, oh, actually Z is wrong. I, I did it myself just to double check and Z is wrong. They can file a dispute that says, actually it should be Z prime instead. And I have $1,000 that says it's Z prime. Only when there's a dispute, okay, uh, then you can go to the whole network and get the whole network to recompute the method to verify which end of the dispute is right. So if there's no disputes, it goes almost for free. And if there are disputes, then you have to invoke all the nodes to try and resolve the disputes. But what you can do that's very clever is you can actually pinpoint where exactly in the method do the two people start disagreeing. So instead of rerunning the whole method, you could say, you know, even down to like the assembly operation, you could say, this is the assembly operation inside this method where we disagree. So we just want everyone to, to, you know, take the inputs to that and compute the output, and then we can resolve the dispute. 
Um, so, so they end up being very cheap. This is a paper that appeared at Usenix Security. Once again, not our own research. Uh, it's called Arbitrum, also turned into a company that's kind of leading the charge on this technology, which is called optimistic rollups. And we use Arbitrum now in our labs all the time. So we write a lot of dApps uh, for Ethereum specifically. And now we, we just use Arbitrum because it, it saves so much money uh, in terms of, of how much, how expensive uh, the computations are. All right, here's, here's another uh, research idea. Um, so one of the big problems, probably the most, well, one of the most notorious things in, in Bitcoin's past is there's exchanges uh, that hold Bitcoin and Canadian dollars and they'll let you convert between the two or US dollars, depending on where they're located. Uh, you probably heard of one in Canada called, called Trigex uh, and it was like a big scam. The, the original uh, problem, problematic exchange, I'm hesitant to call it a scam because no one knows for sure if it was just incompetence or if it was actually a scam. Uh, but it was called Mt. Gox, and they lost basically half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. It was hacked; someone stole it. Uh, it actually took thousands, or sorry, it took uh, it took many years uh, for for the company to even notice uh, that the Bitcoin was gone. And so we had this idea of, well, I wonder if you could, if you were an exchange, you could actually prove that you have enough Bitcoin to satisfy all of your customers. So think of all the Bitcoin that you own as your assets, that's the purple block. And uh, you have a bunch of users and, and they have money that's sitting on your exchange. So they deposit it and it's sitting there waiting to be converted into Canadian dollars or they just bought Bitcoin and they haven't pulled it off the exchange yet. So these are your gray things, which are your liabilities. And basically you wanna know that the purple minus the gray is greater than zero. Now, of course you could publish all of this information, make it public, uh, but that would reveal a lot of privacy information. Okay, so could you do it under the covers of encryption? Could you hide the liabilities, who they're for, how much they actually are, and just get the sum total of them and not even reveal that number, but just use that sum total to compare it to the sum total of the purple box. And similarly with the purple box, you're not going to point out which Bitcoin addresses belong to you. You're not going to prove how many assets you have. All you're going to do is you're going to say, I have this number that represents the sum total of all my assets. It's under encryption. I have the same on my liabilities. I'm going to subtract them and I'm just going to prove to you that they're, that, that number is bigger than zero. Um, so anyway, so it maybe sounds kind of trivial, but you have to really torture uh, cryptographic systems in order to do this, but you absolutely can do it. Uh, so this was a paper uh, that we had at CCS a few years ago uh, that, that proposed a system for solving it. And one of the authors, uh, the second author, uh, actually made it a lot faster with something called bulletproofs. Uh, and so, so if you're interested, if this strikes your interest, uh, you can read a bit about that research. Okay, the final thing I wanna talk a bit about is this area called decentralized finance or DeFi. And so the idea of DeFi is, as we know, Ethereum's a general blockchain. It can execute any application that anyone can write. And those applications could be for financial technologies. Okay, so that's great. Now, why this is a game changer is because now anybody, let's say you're, I don't know, a 12 year old kid who knows how to program in Solidity, which is the programming language used by Ethereum, and you have some idea of some financial technology that should exist, you can launch that, right? And once it's launched, anyone can use it if, if, if that's the way you set it up. And there's no limits to the amount of money that might flow through that contract. In fact, now, like the sort of sum total of, of DeFi services have about $10 billion US uh, on Ethereum in various you know, different tokens uh, that are held. Um, so this is small compared to the global financial system, but it's not immaterial, okay? This is a big number and it's growing and you know, there's a lot of interest. People, celebrities are tweeting about it and, and things like that. Uh, and so we expect that this number is only going to get larger. So what's in the world of DeFi? So I'll, I'll just show you a few of the things. So one thing is, remember the very first, at the very start of the talk, I talked about how we have the Bitcoin so volatile, and that's not really good for a currency. So what if you could bring Canadian dollars onto a blockchain like Ethereum? And so it turns out that you can. Uh, so these are called stable coins. There's different ways of setting them up. So one of the one way is is just with a trusted party. So a trusted party 
claims that in the bank account, they have a million dollars and they issue a million tokens and they say each token can be redeemed for $1. Uh, so that's like the tether model. Uh, there's another model that uses smart contracts where you kind of, it, it's complicated, it's called DAI and there's a way to do it with less trust. Um, so we have a, an article that tries to summarize this whole area uh, also in the communications of the ACM uh, called demystifying stablecoin. So I'll refer you to that if, if it sounds interesting to you. Another thing is exchanges. So you have pink tokens and you want to turn them into blue tokens. Uh, you can go off chain and just use a traditional exchange that's set up kind of like a stock exchange with an order book or their solutions on chain. One of the most popular is called Uniswap. Uh, it has a very interesting algorithm behind it that I, I won't go into details of, um, but it basically, you have two piles of coins and when you take one kind of coin out, you have to put a certain amount of the other coins back in and it changes dynamically over time. So it's a very weird system, but, but interesting system. Uh, the other big uh, thing that we see emerging in DeFi is different flavors of lending. So the one kind of lending that's not on DeFi is Alice wants a loan. We're going to give it to Alice because we trust Alice. She has a good reputation. Okay, that kind of loan doesn't really exist. A, we don't know who anyone is on Ethereum and we don't have any like credit histories or anything like that. And so we don't know whether someone can be trusted. And even if they borrowed and repaid money, you know, 10 times in the past, it doesn't mean that they're going to do it the next time, right? So there's this concept of an exit scam where you, you behave honestly, so people give you more and more money and then eventually you just disappear with the money. Um, so that, that kind of lending is, is at least a ways off uh, for Ethereum. But there are other kinds of lending where, for example, let's say I wanna invest uh, in, let's say I have ETH and I wanna buy Bitcoin. Uh, what I can do is I can borrow money to make that investment. So the investment is held by someone else, uh, but they're gonna mix their money in with my money and it gives me a leveraged position. So if Bitcoin goes up, uh, I pay, I get 10 times the amount of money that I invested, but if it goes down, I have to pay 10 times. And if it goes down too much, then they'll liquidate me and they'll, they'll keep all of my money. Uh, another thing you can do is you can post, let's say you have some ETH, you can post it and borrow Bitcoin against the amount of ETH that you posted. And you're borrowing Bitcoin from other users who are kind of doing the opposite. And there's interest rates that are exchanged. And so this is a way that if you have ETH, it's lying around, and it, uh, so ETH, I should have mentioned, uh, forgive me, is, is Ethereum's uh, currency. It's like the Bitcoin equivalent on Ethereum. And so if you have ETH that's lying around, you can put it in this kind of lending service and you can earn some interest on it, uh, which is uh, sort of interesting. Um, none of these are risk-free. So if the amount of ETH or whatever token you're dealing with goes down in price too much, uh, then you could start losing money and there was a, an occasion where the price of ETH dropped radically in a day. Uh, and there, were, there was all sorts of problems for these DeFi services. The final thing I'll talk about are flash loans. And flash loans are really cool because there's actually nothing like this in the real world. This is like a real specialty of blockchain. So the word transaction in blockchain just means a set of instructions. So if you want you know, different operations to be done, on a blockchain, you can bundle them all together in a transaction. There's some upper limit on the size of a transaction, but you can do multiple steps within a transaction. Now on Ethereum, only one transaction runs at a time. So at the start of your transaction, you basically control the whole state of the world of Ethereum. And you might make changes, not just to contracts that you control, but to other people's contracts. But no one can react to those changes until your transaction finishes. And so that gives you this really powerful property that if you get halfway through a transaction, you can always rewind it and revert it and make it like that transaction never happened. And there's no collateral damage to doing that because everything you change, no one was allowed to touch uh, because you were the only transaction that was running. Okay, so they might see it change and then it, it doesn't even work like that. But, but anyways, they, they could see it, but they couldn't do anything about it anyways until they're allowed to run their transaction. So what you can do is you can create these loans that basically say at the start of your transaction, you borrow some amount of ETH. You go do something with that ETH. You're trying to make money with it. And if you're successful and you make enough money to repay the loan, you repay it within the same transaction. And the last step of the transaction checks whether you repaid it or not. If you repaid it, then that's good. The transaction completes. And if you didn't repay it, 
then it just reverts as if they never lended you that money in the first place. Okay, so there's some like, I don't know, time bending logic uh, to this, but, but this actually works. And the crazy thing about it is it's 100% risk free, or sorry, it's, yeah, it's 100% riskless, right? Uh, there's, there's nothing that you can do to, to uh, you know, sort of disrupt it. And so as a result, people will lend huge amounts of monies, you know, hundreds, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of value. Uh, they'll lend it to anyone. They'll charge almost no fees for it. You can be completely anonymous. You don't have to post any collateral or anything. I could show up and just get this loan. The only trick is I have to repay it within the same transaction. So these are called flash loans. And you know people are running around with them like a sledgehammer and they're hammering. Uh, if there's any kind of security vulnerability in these services, they have you know, this huge sledgehammer that they can hammer it with and they can make a lot of money. So this is an example of an attack that I will not go through. Uh, if you're interested in this attack, if it strikes your fancy. Uh, so I'm part of a project called Serene Risk. Sonia uh, Chayasan is, is one of the PIs on that project. And I gave a recent talk where I spent 20 minutes going through this, this attack. And so you can find it on my website or, or Google it, it's on YouTube. Um, but anyways, I, I, I just show the graphic to give you the visual impression of how complicated it is. But basically this whole attack happened in a single transaction. Someone went and did some margin trading and then they were doing swaps and they were doing everything with a flash loan. And there was a vulnerability in one of these smart contracts and they basically made, uh, it wasn't a lot, they made hundreds of thousands of dollars in an instant. But this kind of attack has been repeated again and again. And now there's a lot of academic literature on, okay, how can we identify these attacks? You know, How can we stop them? Uh, how can we, see whether they're optimal or not. And I've seen maybe 10 papers in just the last two, two years uh, on this kind of stuff. And so this is a really hot uh, research area right now. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually done under time. Uh, so I'll just point you to some more resources in case you're interested in, in learning more about Bitcoin. Uh, so one thing is I did teach a course on Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, it's free on YouTube. So if you're interested in it, uh, you can watch all of the lectures. Uh, there's also a really great course on Coursera. Uh, it's a little older, so it really only covers Bitcoin and a little bit of uh, like Ethereum and, and other things. Uh, but it, it's also very thorough. I give one of the lectures and it was converted into a textbook. Uh, so I wrote the preface for the textbook and uh, you can read this textbook for free. It's available as a PDF uh, or you can buy a paper copy if, if you so wish. Uh, and it's, it's very good. I, I strongly recommend it. So uh, that's it for me, and I'm happy to take questions for as long as you have questions. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for the uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, just uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, I'm William So. I'm the uh, president of the Carlton Computer Science Society, and uh, we were very happy to be able to invite uh, Jeremy for this talk today. Uh, there are some questions that have come through uh, during the uh, presentation. So I will, uh, I'll just, I'll just feed them to you as we, as we go along here. Uh, so uh, first one from John Keel uh, says, uh, you mentioned Satoshi as the inventor, uh, but Satoshi is a pseudonym for an unknown person or organization or government or NGO or crime syndicate. Uh, we just don't know. And some firms today are linking the exposure of a true identity as a corporate risk. Is this a valid risk? Okay, uh, so let me say a bit about Satoshi and then I'll, I'll try and answer the direct question. So yeah, it's correct. So Satoshi Nakamoto is presumed to be a pseudonym for someone yet to be identified. Um, uh, there, there are people who claim to be Satoshi Nakamoto but uh, the community remains very skeptical that they actually are. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto was someone who didn't, it's not just like that person, um, I'll call him a he because he uses a male name. Uh, it's, it's not like he just, uh, dropped a white paper and dropped some code and disappeared. He actually stuck around for like a year answering emails and promoting the system and working with other developers uh, to, to improve the system. And it's for that reason that I think it's probably, the, the simplest explanation is it's a single person. It just makes the most sense. Someone was, you know, the idea of sharing passwords across different accounts and things like that seems crazy to me. It's probably a single person. Uh, they did it and then they maintained it and then they, they eventually uh, disappeared. Uh, now, the question is, is there a risk uh, to 
that person being de-identified and then I guess somehow the system becomes less credible uh, be based on who that person is. I suppose it's, it's kind of a long tail risk. Uh, I think the system kind of speaks for itself. Uh, and the fact that, that you know, for 10 years people have studied it, people like the technology itself. I'm not sure that it matters so much anymore who, in, who invented the system. All right, uh, second question also from John. Uh, if the majority of mining is done in one nation, who may be, uh, sorry, if the majority of mining is done in, in one nation who may become rogue, uh, could mining become, uh, or can mining be used in the future to destabilize enemies or economies if the mining is switched off overnight? Um, okay, uh, so first off, the, mining is very chunky uh, in terms of, of who does it. So uh, China traditionally was uh, did a lot of uh, the mining. I forget what the percentages are. Uh, you're looking for somewhere where electricity is cheap. If it's a cold climate, that works great because uh, it's free air conditioning. The servers get very hot. Uh, you want a good internet connection because it's not enough to solve these puzzles. You have to relay them very fast to your peers. Uh, and then you also want political stability. So the governance can kind of ban it tomorrow, which is sort of speaking to what the question's about. Uh, the Chinese miners kind of got spooked by some of the signs given by the Chinese government. And so they started relocating elsewhere, including Quebec, uh, which has a lot of those properties uh, that I missed, I mentioned. Um, and so anyways, if you just switched off mining in a country, then basically the, the power, like the decentralization would become a lot narrower, but it would still be distributed around the world. And so I, I don't see that as a big threat. But if you had a strict majority within a country and the country was somehow able to take over those servers or direct them, you know, give them an executive order that they must do certain things, then that could be a big vulnerability, then the, then the system could be attacked. And so I'd be a lot more worried about that type of behavior from a government than just switching it off hard hitting questions so far. Uh, okay, uh, this is this one's from an anonymous attendee. Uh, I have a question concerning Bitcoin as we see the price of Bitcoin increasing and decreasing almost all the time uh, and is affected especially now by um, some of Elon Musk's tweets, for example. Uh, why should someone invest in Bitcoin if it is not backed up by gold or other kinds of metals like the um, like other currencies? Okay. So it's absolutely true that there is an impact on price from, from things like Elon Musk tweeting about it. This is a sign to me that, that there's a lot of speculation in the, in the market. It, it could even be a bubble uh, in terms of the price. Uh, that's the kind of behavior that you see. Uh, so it's not based on fundamentals. Uh, as mentioned, there are no fundamentals backing Bitcoin up. So there's no book value. Like if you buy a stock, you at least know how much the company's worth. Like what's their assets minus their liabilities. You can compute that number. You can figure out I own one one millionth of that. And so you can put a price. Now you might pay more for the company because you think that number is going up. Uh, but, but anyways, you can anchor the price in something. Bitcoin has absolutely no anchor. Uh, so no one knows how much it's worth. No one knows if it's incredibly overvalued or undervalued. And it was a literal get rich fast scheme that kind of worked. If, if you bought Bitcoin when it was 50 cents, you got rich fast. Uh, and so I think there's, you know, a lot of people want to get in on the action. And this is also like signs of, of a bubble as well, where people are investing uh, because, you know, because the price went up, they're investing, hoping that it goes up more and their investment actually drives the price up itself. And so you get this sort of feedback loop that's not sustainable. Um, so th those are some reasons maybe to be cautious about thinking about investing in Bitcoin. I personally don't think anyone should invest in Bitcoin. I'm not saying don't buy Bitcoin. If you want to buy Bitcoin and use it as a currency, that's great. But if you want to buy Bitcoin for the purposes of investment to, to earn a return of, on investment, I, I would at least I would not invest any more than you're prepared to lose uh, because because there's no yeah, there, there's nothing underpinning the price uh, of Bitcoin. Now, I, uh, I'll, I'll also mention that why is Bitcoin not worth zero dollars? Why is it actually valuable? It, it's valuable as long as someone else will accept it. So if I'll accept Bitcoin because I know that someone else will accept it, it works as a medium of exchange. And so for a medium of exchange, it doesn't matter if it's worth a dollar or $10,000. It just needs to be worth not zero. So I believe very, very strongly that Bitcoin is not worth zero dollars. I'm not trying to say that it's worth zero dollars. But in terms of the exact amount that it's worth, uh, I, I have no idea. And there are some concerning signs that, that suggest that maybe it's overvalued. 
All right. Uh, next question from Connor Belesny. Uh, I've heard that cryptocurrency adoption is at a similar stage as the internet was around the year 2000. Considering that the internet giants around the year 2000 aren't really around anymore, do you think a similar situation will arise with Bitcoin where the future Amazons and Facebooks of cryptocurrency don't exist yet? Or will Bitcoin and Ethereum always be king and queen? Okay, this is a nice question. So the first thing I want to do is differentiate between Bitcoin, the, the, the brand, and Bitcoin, the protocol. So really, there is no, like Bitcoin's not a company. It's, it's a technology. So if you want to make the analogy to internet, Bitcoin is more like HTTP or something like that, or HTML or, or some important web technology. And those things didn't change. So it's true that the companies that went in and monetized that protocol, they changed over time, but the protocols themselves ha have actually been very stable. And so I don't know how far that analogy goes. Maybe it's a good one or a bad one, but if you wanna run with that analogy, the answer would have to be that it seems that Bitcoin will stay or Ethereum or at least technologies that are, are kind of maybe generational improvements on them those are the kinds of things that, that might have long-term value, but the companies that are being built up using them, they, they could churn, there could be an innovator's dilemma or, or all sorts of things uh, that could, could, yeah, could cause some churn in terms of, of who's a, a big company 10 years from now. All right. Uh, next question from Paul Van Orchard. Uh, do you have a view on how serious the Canadian or other governments are about possibly supporting some custom design cryptocurrency as an official currency. Okay, so first, hi to Paul, who was my postdoc supervisor, and recently he says hi as well. Yeah, and uh, okay, so this is something called a CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. So the idea is that uh, countries, including the Bank of Canada, are trying to assess whether issuing a digital currency would be interesting, and it could be a cryptocurrency meaning like it, it deploys some blockchain technology. It could be as simple as something that is in a database that sits at the Bank of Canada. So um, the, the first question is, are they interested in the CBDC? And the answer is yes, they are exploring it. They, they have not committed to doing it, but you can see there's a steady stream of uh, staff reports coming out of the Bank of Canada. You know, there's pretty much one every month or sometimes multiple uh, per month on different technologies that could be used or what the privacy properties would be and, and all sorts of different things. And it's not just the Bank of Canada. We see all the central banks and sort of the, the kind of, you know, the G20 kind of countries uh, are all interested in, in this question. So I think there's um, the interest is there. Now, will it actually happen? I don't know. I think it's too early to say. They're, they spend a lot of time worrying about the business case. Like if they do it, is anyone actually going to use it? Will people care? Uh, and that may also be influenced by how it's designed, uh, whether whether people want to use it or not. And so I think that's a, a very much an open question, but it, for certain they are exploring it. And there's probably going to be some notion of cryptography in that currency as well. It might not be a full fledged like kind of blockchain solution, uh, but but there's going to be like some of the properties like around tamper resistance and, and stuff like that for sure, if, if they did that type of uh, currency as well. So I'm very interested in this question myself. It's it's one of my main research topics going forward. Perfect. Another question from uh, Connor. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to work as a blockchain developer or engineer as a career and potentially work on their own DeFi project? Okay, so what I would say is, first off, uh, I didn't really emphasize this, but Ethereum is also open source software. Uh, which means that that you know anyone can contribute uh, to the code, and a lot of DeFi projects are as well. So there's a real open source movement behind DeFi as well. So that's really great if you're a developer. My students, what will happen is like for example, we started using Arbitrum a lot. So my students are on the Discord channel for Arbitrum. They're talking with the developers, and I think that's a really good way forward. Is just find a project that you like and try and integrate yourself, be useful to them, test it out, try their code. If you can find some bugs or you know, do some pull requests, uh, then, then that's great as well. The other path which you identify is also a good one, which is you could just do your own uh, technology. And for that, you need a good idea. So if you have that good idea, you could code it up yourself. I did sort of, maybe I misled you by saying that the bar to entry is really low, like you know, a 12 year old could do it. It's true, a 12 year old could do it, but you also wanna get security audits and, and, and things like that. You wanna have other people review your code and make sure that it's correct. So it's maybe not quite a one person job, 
Um, but uh, you, you can definitely pursue the idea uh, of, of deploying your own system as well. But if you don't want to do that, what I say is sort of latch on to a project that you find interesting. And I think you'll have lots of opportunities to contribute and they, they could very well lead to jobs. A lot of blockchain companies are hiring too, like crazy. There's a lot of VC venture capital flowing into this space still, uh, especially at the like kind of protocol level, if you're doing any sort of performance enhancement and those kinds of things. Um, if you just have some crazy token on top, there's not as much money in that anymore. But the the real infrastructure level projects are, are still attracting a lot of funding. And a, a lot of these projects that I know about are, are hiring like crazy. They, they can't hire people fast enough. Cool. Um, okay, I think a few questions also came in just through the general chat window. I'll just go through them chronologically. Um, if or when the queen isn't uh, on even 30% of the economy, what, do you, what effect do you think this will have on all effects of government, all, all, all levels of government? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was, I was reading them, but I don't see the one that you're reading. Yeah, so this, this one's from the chat. I'm not sure specifically the context of this, uh, yeah. but from Jake Hanna. Uh, if or when the queen isn't even on 30% of the economy, what effect do you think this will have on all levels of government? Sorry, did you say if the, the queen isn't on 30%? Yes, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the context of this uh, is referring to. Okay, um, maybe they can clarify the question. I, I don't quite understand it either. Uh, a clarification on, um, okay, from Jake, the queen isn't on our dollar. Okay, I think I think maybe what they're asking is when uh, the economy runs on like money that's not legal tender, uh, what effect will it have on on government? So if 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 that's the question, um, the answer is a significant effect. So this is the kind of thing that uh, that the central bank monitors very closely. So they want to know, and this is why they're interested in CBDCs. It's also why they weren't that interested in Bitcoin yet because they see that it's such a small percentage of the overall Canadian economy. And so they're sort of waiting for it to cross some threshold that they have in their mind uh, before they decide that, that, that they need to do something like look at more regulation or try and compete uh, directly with it. So if it got up to 30%, I think governments, you would see major policy shifts uh, in terms of, and, and the only thing they can really do, they could try to censor it, probably wouldn't work. The, the main thing they could do is compete with it. And so I, I think if 30% of people started using cryptocurrencies or 30% of the value in the economy, I think the government would, would do a CBDC tomorrow. All right, uh, just, and just to remind um, everyone that there is a specific Q&A chat window. That's not the uh, general chat that um, allows us to kind of sort through these a little bit easier. So if you have new questions coming in, uh, please direct them to that window. Uh, okay, uh, Anonymous uh, asks, Aside from the value that Bitcoin offers and looking at it as a way to move our cash from being subjected to inflation to investing it in Bitcoin since inflation does not affect it, uh, what about money laundering actions that might occur and can't be tracked? Okay, so financial tracking is a big issue on blockchain. And uh, it's something that FinTrack, who does the, the anti-money laundering uh, for Canada, know about. Uh, the way they're regulating it right now is they're saying, you can't really do much with your Bitcoin in the format of Bitcoin. And so, you know, usually you're going to have to at some point convert it back to Canadian dollars or convert Canadian dollars into Bitcoin. And so that's where we're going to sit. We're going to watch those exchanges very closely. We're going to regulate them. We're going to make sure that they have financial reporting. Uh, and, and that's where we're going to try and catch you. Once you're on Bitcoin, you can do anything. You can move any amount of money anywhere in the world. And it's if, if you're careful, it's basically not traceable. And so there, there's not much uh, that they can do. And so, yeah, yeah. So, so money laundering is a concern for sure. A uh, question from Anil Somayaji. Uh, what could happen to Bitcoin if someone found a major software vulnerability or a cryptographic weakness? How robust is the ecosystem to such possibilities? Okay, so first, hi to Anil. Uh, uh, secondly, um, so, so it, it's not robust at all. Um, it depends. So actually, believe it or not, there was a major software vulnerability very early in Bitcoin. Uh, the Bitcoin core team identified it. They updated it. They didn't tell anyone why they were updating. They just sort of pushed the update. I think they brought some miners in on the loop and said, sat them down and said, this is very serious. Uh, you need to update. And so everyone updated. And by the time that, that 
people realized what the vulnerability was, they reverse engineered it. Uh, everyone had updated anyways, and, and so it was too late. Um, and so that's basically the approach. So if, if there's some vulnerability that's not disclosed, what they'll do is they'll get all the miners to update or, or agree to update, and everyone will pull the trigger at the same time. Now, if it's publicly disclosed, then it's really hard to combat uh, because the system requires basically, you need a majority of the nodes to update their software. Um, now, another alternative is you can roll back. So this happened in Ethereum. It wasn't a problem with the protocol. It was actually a problem with the code of adapt that someone was running on, on Ethereum, but they decided that it was substantial enough that they actually rolled back the blockchain to like kind of undo the attack. And because the money from the attack didn't circulate in the economy, it, it was a really weird situation that that's probably not a general situation at all. But that, that's another option uh, that you could consider. If there was a problem with the crypto, say, I don't know, quantum computers came out and you could break ECDSA, well, first off, you can break the whole banking infrastructure. And so I don't know that Bitcoin would, would be your, your number one target. Um, but if you went after Bitcoin, they really can't do much about it. So. That is, that is a very serious risk uh, with these kinds of systems. They're, they're not agile at all uh, in terms of updates. All right, I'm just noticing the uh, time right now and I do believe we want to wrap it up around eight o'clock. So maybe we'll go through a few more, uh, see, if, see how many we can get through. We did get a lot of questions coming in though. So just going through uh, chronologically, uh, maybe we could perhaps speed it up a little bit or, or maybe just bring it to a close uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so Randy Kwong says, "Hi Jeremy, uh, how do you think how do you think the security threats of blockchain from how do you think the security threats of blockchain from quantum computing? Okay. Uh, how how can we update the current blockchains with quantum safe cryptography?" Okay, so the crypto and blockchain uses there's two functions that are used. One are hash functions, which are quantum resistant, and uh, the other is the digital signature scheme, which is not. And so you have to replace the digital signature scheme, but then you also have to have everyone who has money assigned to the old system kind of move it into a safe account with the, the new system. And so um, because people think that quantum computing is maybe 10 to 30 years off, I think the Bitcoin team is, is just waiting for a really nice post-quantum digital signature to come out and, and there to be a lot of... Um, and I should note that, that there's lots of protocols that this affects. It's not just Bitcoin itself. And so I think the, the industry as a whole are kind of waiting uh, to find that, that perfect signature algorithm. And once they do, they'll deploy it. But then there's the task of like rolling all the old users over uh, that will be very hard. All right, uh, I think we have time for one more. Jeremy, did you want to select uh, this question uh, from, the, from the list? Because just because I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, eliminate the possibility of somebody who asked their question a little bit more recently from getting answered. If well, let's you, just uh, go chronologically. First in, first out. All right. No worries, no worries. Uh, okay. Um, what's preventing someone from developing a stable coin with transaction time similar to XRP? Okay, so XRP is called Ripple. It's an alternative uh, to Bitcoin. It has faster transaction times, as, as was mentioned. Um, and so there's nothing stopping it. Uh, some people have stable coins. They run on their own custom blockchains, and they are faster uh, than Bitcoin's blockchain or Ethereum's. The, people, the reason people prefer it on Ethereum is because there's so much other useful stuff on Ethereum to do with the stable coin. So it's one thing if you just want to send payments, but if you want to interact with DeFi apps, then you have to, this, this speaks to a larger problem of cross-chain communication. It's really hard to have a currency on one, ch one chain, one blockchain system and, and use it on a different blockchain system. And so the reason that people like stable coins on ETH is because that's where they're using it effectively. All right, I believe that does bring it, uh, the Q&A period to a close as we do have to kind of wrap up here. I'll pass this back over to uh, Michelle then. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Will. Um, I would like to thank the speaker, uh, Professor Jeremy Clark, for this very enli enlightening talk about uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, I would like also to thank the, uh, the people on the panel who helped me uh, put this talk together uh, this evening. And um, uh, I, I also, also thank you, a big thank you to all the, the participants and uh, see you next year again for the, another lecture on computer science and society. Good evening, everyone. <laughs>